Does science really say we have to give up meat to save the planet? There are lots of people with strong opinions about what you should be eating. In this video, we look at what we know about whether they're right, that you should change your diet to save the planet. This is the Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. Recently, a new report from the Eat Lancet Commission on Food and Planet Health came out which claimed to identify the diet the whole world should adopt in order to be able to cope with 10 billion people by 2050, whilst also making climate change reductions and improving health. Now, the report bases its recommendations on the premise that, quote, a radical transformation of the global food system is urgently needed. Without action, today's children will inherit a planet that's been seriously degraded, where much of the population will increasingly suffer from malnutrition and preventable disease. Sounds bad, I think you'll agree. The report authors have done the work for us and identified the diet we all need to eat from now on. It basically involves doubling the amount of vegetables and nuts, drastically reducing the amount of meat, especially beef. So in a standard day, you'd be allowed 14 grams of red meat, twice as much fish, one egg per week, so no one's going to be making cakes ever again. The rest is nuts, legumes, carbs, vegetables, fruit and one glass of milk per day. It would involve Europeans eating 77% less meat and US citizens eating 84% less. It will be, say the authors, a great food transformation. And although some parts of the world will be more easily able to adapt to the diet than others, there are a range of public policy mechanisms that go up the coercive scale to ensure that we fall into line. Now, it's very specific, but in fact, it's just the latest in the line of news stories of late, saying that to save the planet, we're all going to have to go near vegetarian. In October last year, there was a rash of headlines caused by a study published in Nature that was followed by suggestions there should be a meat tax to penalise people who want to eat meat until they change their ways. Now, I'm interested in how we achieve sustainable food, and I also love delicious food of all kinds. I've always said that I thought the best way forward was that you reduce the impact of traditional diets as much as possible and make some gradual evolutionary changes to diets where you need to. Why? Because you don't want to destroy the joy of food that we have. We want to celebrate fantastic food if we can. And if people can mostly have the fantastic food that they love, they'll support the changes that do need to take place. I always thought that if we all end up eating rice and beans, it'll be because we failed to adapt quickly enough and we were forced into an undesirable fallback to austerity. The reason why hardcore environmentalists will never be trusted as change makers in this space is that they give every impression of seeing that undesirable fallback as being exactly what they would choose for us all as their diet of first choice. If someone really works hard for us to keep what we've got, we'll probably believe them if they tell us that we failed and we now have to suffer some consequences. If, on the other hand, you have people who would be disappointed if we found a way to make a wide range of meats more sustainable, then you have a minority agenda. And so you'll never trust their facts, their analysis, nor their proposals, because they don't want the same as you do. So I decided it was high time that I looked at some of the science behind this discussion to try to make sense out of it. I'm keen to follow the facts, wherever they may lead. My gut instinct is, after all, just that. So on the climate change side, then, let's see the size of a prize here. In other words, what contribution does the food production sector, and in particular the animal agriculture sector, make towards greenhouse gas emissions? In 2006, the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization produced a report called Livestock's Long Shadow, which said that livestock produced 18% of worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. Now, actually, that claim was shown to be incorrect and was subsequently corrected by Henning Steinfeld, the report's author, to be 14.5% in an updated report. Mistakes happen, but it should be an early indication that really the science here is a work in progress. Beef and cattle milk produces the majority of those emissions, 41 and 20% respectively. Pig meat and poultry eggs is 9 and 8%. From those sources, the production and processing of animal feed is the main source at 45%. What's called enteric fermentation from ruminants is 39%. People tend to think this means farting cows, although science can reveal to you that it's actually mostly burping. I know. You will end today so much better informed than you started it from that fact alone. 
Now at the moment, meat eating is growing faster in developing countries, about 3% annually. That's because although the Eat Lancet report celebrates some traditional diets that are already close to their preferred version, the populations that have lived those diets often did so because of a poverty of choice. And as extreme poverty declines, they're using some of that additional wealth to embrace exactly the dietary elements for report writers most dislike. One good piece of news, though, is that technical improvements over the last 70 years have made livestock production more efficient. According to the FAO, total greenhouse gas emissions for the sector have declined by 11.3% since 1961, whilst production of meat has more than doubled. Is there scope for more reductions? Frank Mitlaner thinks so. He points out that 70 million US cows will be needed to produce all global dairy products, but in actual fact it took 364 million. Now, not everyone may be able to produce those products as efficiently as that for several reasons, but there's clearly plenty of scope for efficiency improvements. Cutting across the categories, the consumption of fossil fuels along the supply chains account for 20% of emissions. Presumably, shifting energy generation in the future will reduce or remove that contribution without any dietary changes required. Indeed, if producers worldwide followed best practices, including better quality feed and feed balancing, improved breeding and animal health and energy recovery from manure management, it's estimated that 30% reduction in emissions would be possible. And there are more radical opportunities in there. At the moment, it's thought that lab-grown meat could cut meat emissions by up to 96%. Now, even if that's a significant overstatement, it's clear that there's big technological progress to be made. So why aren't we talking about the need to reduce the impact of the sector rather than focusing in on diet as the sole potential lever for that change to happen? Well, to be honest, that's not quite true. Everybody agrees that part of the solution is to reduce the contribution made by food that is then wasted. Around a third of all food produced is wasted. In developing countries, this tends to be before it reaches the consumer because of the absence of refrigeration and good distribution logistics. In the industrial world, it tends to be post-consumer, that's us, throwing food away after we've bought it. Incidentally, I did a previous video where I talked about a few tips and tricks you can use to waste less food. But yes, it does seem that a lot of the environmentalists and highly motivated researchers in this area find that diet is the place to focus in on. Not everyone goes along with the suggestion that this is the way to make the big difference. One recent study suggested that moving towards more plant-based diets would reduce food-related emissions by 29% compared with a reference scenario in 2050. You have to note that statement, though, because the comparison does rather depend on the assumptions in the reference scenario. If that scenario is simply business as usual, no efficiency improvements of any kind, then it's a weighted deck. And the reference scenario in this case assumed emissions would increase by 51%. A different report estimates that reducing meat consumption by between 25% to 50% would reduce emissions from the sector by 25% to 40%. This would reduce the total overall emissions by 3.6% to 5.8%. But some suggest the contribution would be smaller because of a feedback effect, which is that because vegetarian food is cheaper, people would spend the additional money saved in other ways that create additional emissions. So in that case, the contribution would be 2.6% of overall emissions. Why the variation in results? Because each study makes all sorts of assumptions in how they model what changes will be achieved by what scenarios. Now, that reduction isn't chump change, to be fair. Other changes in energy production will be way more important, but we need improvements in lots of different ways. So the question is really, are we sure that the evidence backs up this specifically policy, inst policy instrument as a key area of focus? Because making this change would impact everybody. And it's probably not even achievable. But if it was, are you sure that the impact is big enough to expend all of that political capital? At least one meta-study of the research is very critical of these sorts of conclusions. It says, assessing the environmental performance of diets is complex due to the many types of foods eaten and the diversity of agriculture production systems and local environmental settings. It also criticised the majority of studies for focusing only on greenhouse gas emissions where there are a number of issues of importance. For instance, land and water use and social and economic concerns. It points out that there's scope for carbon sequestration in pastures to offset the greenhouse gas emissions of ruminant livestock and that tree planting on farms can also make possible greenhouse gas neutral livestock production. 
Now, there are no magic bullets, but it's not as straightforward as saying meat is bad, carrots are good. And generally, the dietary change arguments tend to simplify a number of different factors. For example, the difference in impacts between beef cows that are fed on artificial feed and those that are pastured naturally on grass. And the fact that there's a significant percentage of land that can only be used for pasture. Plus, given imperatives around soil erosion, where a system with significant livestock is actually an important part of building up and feeding the soil. In an Australian study, a significant part of the impact of the diet of Australians came from energy-dense and nutrient-poor non-core or discretionary foods, which included alcohol, sugary drinks, confectionery, salty snacks, desserts and processed meats. Now, those haven't even been part of a discussion so far. Do the Eat Lancet authors assume that all such foods get completely outlawed? And if so, what contribution did that make? So all of this is suggesting of two things. One, there are lots of different options in doing what we definitely do need to do, which is reduce the environmental impact of the food sector. Many of these require evolution in production methods without challenging food cultures across the world with radical change. Two, the promised benefits of dietary change in terms of climate change is not consistently evidenced by the research to date, and the proposals for dietary change have taken no account of other potential variations. So that's a quick summary of the complicated state of the current science. But for me, it's not even the most important point. The real point is that you now have groups of researchers coming up with a global plan for what every person is going to be pushed with varying degrees of coercion to eat. For their own good, you understand, but nevertheless, no free will. Now, in what universe do they think anyone's going to give them that power? Let me give you one last nugget of data. According to research by the Human Research Council, only one in five people who convert to a vegetarian or vegan diet sticks with it for as long as a year. Now, what does that tell us? Making such change is hard, even if you decide freely to do it of your own will. So imagine the response if people feel forced to do it by punitive government policies. They won't put up with it. They shouldn't put up with it. If we think the environmentally constrained world is the back door through which you get global central planning and control of the population, I think you'll find you're mistaken. Do we want small groups of experts telling us in detail what we're allowed to eat? If so, then why not what we're allowed to wear? Why not how many children we're allowed to have? And obviously we can't have unsustainable practices coming back in, so that would also inevitably have to include who we're allowed to vote for. I'm sure the report authors didn't consider that they were creating a dystopian vision through their recommendations, but I would certainly see it that way. Ultimately, we'll only achieve a sustainable food system with the consent and participation of the majority of people, which means it'll be about evolving current food traditions, celebrating fantastic food, using efficiency to ensure that such fantastic food can be accommodated on a finite planet. Any other option, however carefully the scientists think they've done their work, is going to fail because it's not just about the science of inputs and outputs. It's also about the science of persuasion and leadership. Now, because I've quoted scientific papers in this video, I've included references for all of them in the notes so you can check where these figures came from and make sure they're correct. Every week there'll be new studies, of course, and they'll probably disagree in their conclusions. So expect this to be a discussion that runs and runs. But as it does so, I will be trusting the voices of people who seem most interested to solve the problem on our behalf, not those that seem to be emotionally attached to a predetermined solution that everyone needs to adopt. Agree? Disagree? Let me know.